So I'm sorry if I misled you. I thought I wrote something. I would, my guess would be I wrote it in some places and not in other places, or some of it is still a hangover from the last time I taught it. That's possible. I didn't revise that. So it's the post is 400 words for each day of class. It's the three things that you brought before class. Two or three things. I think I said three. I, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to count grade you down on reacting to what somebody said during class. And then your final takeaway, which is what was the main thing I got out of this class it, that I would, I might put on my final worldview or I might not and why, right? Because I do want you to keep synthesizing stuff, keep reflecting on the, the material. And um, as soon as you turn it into just this list, then you're not putting in the part of the brain that will where it'll stick. Um, and that's one problem I have with phones, right? So much about our society now is just information, right? And it just comes at you. Um, so I want this class to really be counterculture in that respect. And it just seems like you do fine, right? You understand what I'm saying. So I think you naturally think that way, but you don't necessarily expect to get college credit <laughs> for what you think about on your own. And so this is what I'd like you to do, except you have to do it carefully, right? You just have to do it in a more informed way, like referring to the things we read. And then you have to do it more carefully so that you um, develop, you know, complex point of view, patience with complexity and all that. Um, any other questions while I'm taking attendance here? Um, Michael, is he here yet or no? Oh, no. Um, he was having Wi-Fi issues. He called me before class. They're moving out of their building because they just finished their internship. And he didn't know if he was going to be able to make it. I think he was going to email you, but he said if he hadn't seen it yet to um, say that in class. Yeah, he did email me, so I got that. And Jason is not here yet. OK. Um, all right, so. Let's go to the assignment, make sure that, let me just go back to exactly what I asked you to do. Um, okay, for Thursday, finish reading the chapter on the Houston Smith book and read the attachments below, the Analects and the main themes. Let's see, I asked you to buy the book, the Analects, um, and I think I have the same page numbers. Pick out your two favorite analects and explain to the class why you like them best. Then create two of your own, explain why you wrote them. All right, let's start with that. Um, Confucius analects, the themes, here are the quotes. Um, why don't I just stop the share for a minute? Everybody can pick out, do that, right? Um, class number 13, Confucius. All right, pick out your two favorites. Um, Caitlin, you want to start? Yeah. Um... My first one was, it says, I'm indeed a man with, or 
am I indeed a man with innate knowledge? I have no such knowledge, but when an uncultivated person in all simplicity comes to me with a question, I thrash out its pros and cons until I fathom it. I liked that one because um, I feel like he's acknowledging that he doesn't know everything. And when someone comes with a question, he, like you said, pros and cons until he fathoms it. So he goes on both sides until he understands what the question is so he can give an answer that has reason or not give an answer but like understand the question with reason um the second one was the man of noble mind seeks to achieve good in others and not their evil the little-minded man is the reverse of this and i feel like that one's pretty self-explanatory um it's kind of like the practical wisdom seeking to achieve good in others rather than putting people against each other or causing more problems than solutions. Sounds like liberal arts education, doesn't it? How come the Greeks get credit for that? Like Confucius was a long time before that. Just like how come our, our founders get credit for stuff that, hey guys, even they didn't think they made that up. Okay, anybody want comments uh, or questions for Caitlin? Was anybody else struck by these Analects and going, wait a sec, <laughs> this sounds familiar. Um, so Lakesney, what about you? The two analytics I chose were what I do not wish on others to do to me, but I also, that also I wish not to do to them. And I gotta explain, I gotta explain it out. Well, were you surprised? <laughs> it's kind of the golden rule, my, right? Yeah, it's kind of straightforward. And my other one was, the man of noble mind seeks to the man of noble mind seeks to achieve the good and others and not their evil. And the little minded man is the reverse of this. And to me that was kind of straightforward too. But you know, someone that don't, doesn't think much, I mean they're or they was ignorant, I expect them to be like more messy and like try to get the bad out of people then one smarter. So that's what I got out of that one. Okay. Um, anybody else want to comment? Did anybody else notice the golden rule or the silver rule? Yeah, I actually picked the first one that Lakesney picked too. Like obviously I'm a big fan of the golden rule, but I liked it specifically because you know how the golden rule always say, treat people the way you want to be treated, but this one more focus on the way you shouldn't treat people. Like if you don't want them to do something to you, then don't do it to them. Like I feel like that's the harder part of the golden rule because it takes more empathy than just treating people the way you want to be treated because you already know how you'd feel about that. Want me to go ahead and do my second one while I'm at it? Sure. Okay, my second one was talented yet seeking knowledge from the untalented of many attainments, yet seeking knowledge from those with few, having as though he had not, full yet bearing himself as if empty, offended against yet not retaliating. Once a time of a time I had a friend who lived after this manner so I really like that one because I like the humbleness of it and it's basically showing that no matter what point you are in life there's always something you can learn like you're never like what I'm looking for you never know everything even if you're talented you're never the best like you're never perfect I guess so uh, more of that one is always to stay humble. Mm, that was my favorite one. Any questions or comments?
Well, it does emphasize the difference between the moral virtues and the intellectual virtues, right? People can have talents and smarts, but not be morally upright. Or people can be morally upright and not necessarily super smart, but there's always a lot to learn from everybody, right? Especially if you want to develop a good political community, because we have to get to get, you know, we have to get along, we have to have trust and goodwill. But really, you do learn a lot from people when you ask them, you know, why do you vote the way you vote? You learn a lot, right? And, um, or why do you identify with this party? Or why? Or, you know, more importantly, what, what do you think political association is about? Or when, what times in your life do you, you think of yourself as a citizen, right? So just everybody, everybody's capable of thinking about that. That's what democracy is about, right? And, and that's, that's why I like democracy. I think everybody's capable of thinking like a citizen. It's just that you have to have an educational system that encourages it, right? And then you have to have a culture and friendships. And that, that doesn't have a lot to do with IQ. It has a lot to do with, you have to be mature for one thing. Um, and anyway, so, so it is really important that people who have natural abilities don't lord it over other people or don't use it for corrupt purposes, right? To exploit people for money and power. Um, anybody <laughs> else wanna go ahead, Titus? I just wanna say also, I thought of it from like a coaching or a boss perspective as well, because especially once you get into the season coaches like to focus only on their best players or the ones that are playing the most and tend to ignore those who aren't seemingly as good when in reality you should treat them all the same because you never know what the person you're not paying attention to can be hiding he can have some unknown potential or unknown skill that can secretly help you out in the future so if you take that mentality going into coaching, then you never know what type of advantages you can get or gain. Well, also, um, you know, sports is about teamwork. And, you know, the team doesn't play as well unless everybody on the team feels like they're part of the team, right? This happens in professional sports, doesn't it? When somebody gets a zillion dollar contract and they're kind of, you know, the superman on the team and it lots of times the team just won't hang together if one or two people is getting paid you know 25 times more is that true guys i mean do you guys notice stuff like that yeah and then like i think like would you rather be on a team that has a well-rounded like okay basketball for instance five good players on the court versus one all-star and four like below average or five average like you know like one person can't do it all that's what people say and so it's like what would you rather have I think the I think the Timberwolves once traded off their best player because they really wanted to build the team and they and they just had too much trouble doing that so I think they traded their best player for a couple of high picks, you know? So does that make sense, Mary Hannah? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Again, there were no sports for girls. So I have no experience. Uh, I'm just kind of learning on the fly, you know? Um, and from my students and from my children, but you want to go, Mary Hannah? 
Yes, ma'am, I'll go. Um, I also picked out the golden rule because whenever I read it, I thought of the golden rule and I was like, oh, that'd be a good one to bring up. But um, I don't have to repeat that one. But another one I brought up was I daily examine myself on three points and planning for others. Have I failed in consciousness and intercourse with friends? Have I been insecure and have I failed to practice what I've been taught? I like that one because that one more was like a self check. And I kind of took it personally and asked myself those questions. Like, because I know there are times when I definitely have, and I work with kids a lot in the summer and it's like, sometimes I'm tired or I just don't take into consideration, like what my thoughts and actions will do if I don't, if I'm not intentional. And that one was just kind of a self check reality um, one for me. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay, the stereotype about Confucius is that you are, your identity is entirely caught up in roles that you play, but this is, a, you know, this, this is clearly not so. You have your own consciousness, right? And so you, and you develop your consciousness through your relationships, which that isn't unique to Confucius. That's, you know, Greeks and a lot of ancient, especially ancient philosophy. Um, did you have another one? Not in my notes to this one. Okay. Um, let's see. Where am I here? Um, Akaya? Akaya, are you the one I'm missing? Yes. Okay. So my first quote was, it um, said, in serving his parents, a son may remonstrate with them, but gently, when he sees that they do not incline to follow his advice, he shows an increased degree of reverence, but does not abandon his purpose. And like, like Mary Hannah said with one of her quotes, it kind of brought up like a personal, it was kind of personal for me because like my parents, when I stayed with them and like, I would try to talk to them about things, it's like they wouldn't really understand, but I also feel like it's because they're my parents. They're older, a lot older than me. And then like our generations are different, but I just feel like it also goes back to that. Um, you have to give respect in order to get it because I feel like just because they're your parents, that doesn't necessarily mean that you just have to respect them because there are some instances where parents don't take the time out to get to know like what their kid is going through or like try to talk to them so that that's why the kids and the parents don't have like a good understanding with each other. And then my other one was the stages of life. And um, I just basically said like, not everyone matures at the like the same rate or the same age. Some people are, you know, way older than I am who are still not mature. And then I just feel like it goes to your experience in life and how like what you've been through and stuff like that. So, because I feel like it'll maturity shapes you into a strong person as well. So, yeah. Anybody want to comment on that? I think in the video I talked about that, right? That we emphasize individuality, individual rights, individual goals, individual achievements. And we don't, you know, a lot of Americans don't prioritize relationships, right? Are you going to achieve that? What if you have to step on somebody's toes or you have to, you know, compete? And there are a lot of people in midlife who find themselves very successful, but with no relationships, right? Uh, they thought they were a good dad or whatever but their kids tell them you're never home right you were never there for me so but he was constantly getting rewarded right he had he was successful according to our uh you know culture so i do think confucius provides and the ancient ancients in general look at life phases all right, so the other thing, Akaya, was um, I talked about the midlife crisis, right? 
Okay, so do you, do you have you ever heard, heard about anybody having a midlife crisis or do you know somebody or? Well, I would like just hear people say it a lot, but I wouldn't like they would they just say, oh, I'm having a midlife crisis right now, but they wouldn't really just elaborate for anything. So, Mary Hannah, can you think of an example? No, I was basically going to say what Akaya says. Anytime people are in like a stress situation, they just shout out, oh, I'm going through a midlife crisis. Leave me alone. Like it's an excuse for the problems that they're facing. But I wouldn't know how they would even know like what's technically a midlife crisis. Right. Are they in their mid 40s? What's midlife? For the, well, know? 40, 40. Right. Two, 43. Are they that old when they say it or do they say it when they're 22? Well, like my sister says it now. I'm like, you're 27. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, that's not quite it. Uh, so again, I was just emphasizing that you do have to figure out, you have to live your dream. I mean, find out something you really like to do or else in midlife, it'll be a problem. You'll just think I'm a hollow person. I was always doing what somebody else wanted me to do. And um, it's, it's not a good place to be. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, we've been, that's the first round. Now you all create your own. Okay, so Akaya, you can go first this time. So I, I tried to come up with a, with two. I only came up with one just because like, I really don't think outside of the box like that. And so the first intellect that I came up with is probably already like been said or whatever, but I said, learn to love yourself before, before learning to love others. And um, the reason why I said that is because also with like personal experience, you have to be able to know your worth before you can like help somebody know theirs. You can't try to love somebody else and like you don't love yourself relationship wise and family wise. It just wouldn't really work out. So. All right. Anybody else want to go? I'll just do reverse order from what I did before unless somebody wants to jump in. Okay, so I think Mary Hannah was second to the last on the first round. Um, yeah, I can go, which I really only had one and it was kind of the same, but I kind of took it from my paper. Um, one of them was basically, I was kind of confused on what we were actually supposed to do for this one, but um, I didn't know if you meant to go through the book and find our own quote no. book. No, no, create your own, create your own. Um, well, the only one that I really came up with, um, I would, did actually talk about it, was self-knowledge and basically knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. And I took that into perception of like knowing, um, kind of knowing your place, like knowing your role in like whatever it is that you're doing. In my paper, I talked about a team, but I feel like we talk about a team all the time. But um, just basically not overstepping your boundaries. That would be very Confucian. <laughs> I could have written that book, I guess. <laughs> I well, I mean, look at the four, look at the relationships he has. He has older sibling, younger sibling. Okay, so yeah. we're, did any of you have a, older or younger sibling and you were assigned to take care of each other both oh really older and younger yes ma'am it's hectic here well were there certain duties that you literally had you were assigned to um what do you mean by duties like well the older sibling has to you know make sure the kid gets dressed and gets their backpack packed before school each day, or I mean, just straight out stuff like that. Like there was a time where I was like in charge of picking up my brothers from school and stuff okay. like that. Um, but more of like, not like 
a to-do list, but my sister has always been the one who like gave me all the talks and um, girl things. My mom was closed off like that. So it was always like my sister's job, like my older sibling's job to do those type of things. I'm not gonna go into detail about that. But. <laughs> okay, we can use our imaginations, I guess. Um, did anybody else have certain sibling duties? I, I'm, uh, nobody's commenting. Okay, uh, Titus, you're next. Okay, so like Mary and Akaya, I really had only one good one. And it's basically a man of virtue puts good first, however difficult, and makes what he gains after a bonus. And if it kind of sounds familiar, it's basically a variation of chapter of the chapter 20 on page 30. But what I didn't like about that one is they say a man of virtue puts duty first. And I don't really like them saying duty first because that sounds like it could be good or bad, like accomplishing a mission. So I really wanted, I really preferred if it said the goodness of something. So they can be specifically talking about good intentions. And since I didn't have another one, I found, I picked a third one that I kind of thought was a little controversial. And that one is the scholar who becomes widely versed in letters and who restrains his learning within the bounds of good conduct is not likely to leave the track. So I'm guessing the main moral is if someone keeps their learning or whatever they're learning in goodness, they will not likely be deterred or something like that. So I kind of found that controversial because I feel like you need to be at least educated on bad things to know the true value of good. Because if you only know good, then eventually you're gonna become curious or you're gonna go down the path to that leads bad. But if you don't know any better, then it's just gonna go downhill. So I feel like you have to at least be educated a bit on good to know the, I mean, ed, a bit educated on bad to know the value of good. And so you won't be naive. So does that mean Eve is the hero? Um, If they didn't get kicked out, then yes. <laughs> she ate from the tree, right? She doubted. Uh, okay, so actually that myth could be about the leap in consciousness to self-conscious awareness. Uh, there's like multiple interpretations of what the myth's about, but anyway. Um, the other thing you could think about, Titus, is remember Martin Luther King, he, and I did excerpt it also, in one of those outlines, he said Socrates kept making people uncomfortable, right? So you don't want too much unity. You want this constant self-questioning. You never want to be too satisfied with yourself. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. It kind of matched the second quote I said about talent and being humble and making sure that you always know you have something more to improve on instead of being self-satisfied. Content, that's the word I'm looking for. Content. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so here's, here's an issue. When you say the scholar um, stays within the bounds of good conduct and all that, um, Confucius himself got in trouble with the political leaders, right? Because he called out their corruption. Um, so the problem here is who gets to define good conduct, right? If it's the people in power who get to define it, then what they're saying is the scholar needs to constantly 
uh, promote the leaders, right? And, um, you know, reinforce their, what they're doing and who gets to define good? Because if you have a bad leader, then you would be, you know, you would step outside of the bounds defined by the leader. Does that make sense, Titus? Yes, as far as who defined it, defines it, I feel like it shouldn't be one person or one group of people, because if you give it to only them to decide, then eventually they'll become corrupt and they'll just choose what benefits them. So if you just leave it to one person or group of people, then you will never get the right definition. I feel like it should overall be a conscious thing, if it were up to me. Okay, very good. So that's, you remember John Stuart Mill said, what's the job of intellectuals? You know, they have to provide the vision. They have to keep pushing people because when people get lazy, they just want habit and custom and they don't want to be questioned, but the world changes. And so they're not going to be adapting to the changes. So not to decide is to decide, right? or just to want what we've always done is, is going to get farther and farther from what's the best thing to do. But the person who is progressive will always get accused of, right? Being an atheist, corrupting the youth, going, you know, not doing your duty, whatever. Okay. Um, Lakesney, what have you got? Wait, Trey, I don't have you on here. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Lakesney, but then I have to do Trey. He, he didn't, you know, sorry. Ah, uh, he been slagging. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it had to be about the uh, confusion. Confusion. Or it had to be like a general end of it. The idea was you're supposed to create your own? Regarding the topic? Yeah, there were two things. First of all, you pick you want you right, and then you create a couple of your own. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> I have one. It was uh, life is really simple, but we insist on running a marathon. And yeah, I, I, I didn't get a second one. Okay. Um, so Trey, sorry, I missed, I missed you. I don't know. Uh, go ahead. So you do your, um, the, the analects you found and then the ones you created. All right. Uh, so the first one I had. Uh, the first one I had was concern for people over other values. So I do believe that the more we love each other and the more we care for each other, uh, the world would be a better place. And everybody has their own values and values are very important the way you treat them. But I just feel like as if, if we treat each other with equal respect and equal opportunity, then I feel like we can progress forward in how the way we look at the world. And the second one, uh, the, the second one I have was no delusions, know what you know and do not know. So basically what I got from that is nobody can really tell you what you do and do not know. Um, nobody can really tell you how to like revolve your life or do or do things the way you do things. Um, Everybody knows something that's different from what somebody else knows. And I can't, I can't tell somebody that I know more when it, they could possibly know more than me. Like I have no right to tell somebody what they know and what they do not know. So that's basically what I got from those two. And then uh, the ones that I created was uh, one of them. I kind of, kind of heard it before it is like the bigger picture. So it is just basically just look at the bigger picture. Like it's not just me and it's not just you. Uh, I feel like it's about everybody. It's not about like color. 
or anything like that. And there's a lot of problems in the world, but uh, I guess we just have to live through all the problems that we go through. Um, this is a problem with the whole way of life and it's not gonna change overnight. Uh, but you know, we gotta start somewhere. Um, and then the second one I had, I had it in my mind. Uh, oh yeah, it, it's kind of like, it's, this one's probably been hurt before too, but if I eat, the team gonna eat too. So, I mean, basically by that is basically like, if if I'm going crazy, everybody else going crazy, I'm gonna make sure like my teammates eat, I'm gonna make sure my family eat. And I don't, I don't, cause you know, it's, they say it get lonely at the top, but I don't want to just, you know, be at the top by myself. I want to be able to spread the love and help everybody else out. So basically, yeah, if, you know, if I'm going to eat, everybody go eat pretty much. Okay, good. Um, well, I don't know. I, I must say there've been a lot of um, African-Americans that I, ha I admire a whole lot. And they really stepped up during Black Lives Matter, you know, I just, the, the news outlet that I watched just interviewed a lot of them and they were really amazing. You know, I can't, oh, LeBron James, right? Was he one of the ones that um, stepped up? Then there's, um, gosh, an old basketball player way back from my era. And he had a friend that was a businessman and they were just giving a lot of low interest loans to help African-American uh, entrepreneurial. I mean, it was just, there was so much stuff that was really good. They were just staying positive in the midst of a situation where you know, it was just became more and more obvious that any stereotypes that, you know, it just became more and more obvious that racism is dumb. <laughs> you know, you don't have to say uh, racism is bad. You just sit there and model a mature person. And, you know, unless people really are blind, it's just right in front, it's right there, right? You're just showing people that it's equality. There's high, high levels of maturity and um, expertise and accomplishment. It was just amazing. It was, uh, it was, it wasn't amazing. It was just nice that it was there. It wasn't surprising, but it was um, right there so that you don't have to sit and argue, right? Um, and I do think it tells what happens when you give people opportunity because they will respond, right? And they will show you what they can do. But if they don't have opportunity, they can't. So, so it's important. Um, okay, so Caitlin. Um, so I didn't really come up with any myself I don't know I wasn't really sure what to do with I don't know what happened I just am I'm blonde but I did write down another one from Confucius that I really liked um so I'll just read that one but it was learning without thinking is useless and thinking without learning is dangerous and I really liked that one because like learning without thinking first is useless because if you're just learning things and not actually thinking through them, then you're just blindly taking in things and accepting them as what's true. And then thinking without learning is dangerous because if you're thinking without actually learning the process of your thoughts and like why you're thinking those things, it does become dangerous because then you have people who think things that have no reason, like nothing to back them up. So Okay, good. Um, all right. I don't know if you have any other comments about the Analex, but all right. So that was the first round of stuff that I assigned. Um, read this, the paper on Confucius Analex and the Founding Fathers. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. What did you guys think of this? I, you know, I wish I had known this. A student, you know, wrote a paper maybe 10 years ago and all this data. I just think every 11th grader should read this in high school and we'd all be a lot better off. I mean, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, Samuel Adams. It's just, hey, it, you're not just picking one outlier, you pick a lot. So uh, Trey, what was your reaction to that article? Uh, so we were talking about the, the Confucius article, right? With the founding, and the founding Confucius and the founding fathers. Right. Um, the only thing I really got from that was really like the, the presidents and stuff. I didn't really like dive deep into it or put much thought into it. Um, I, I, did, I did remember it was talking about like a gap between like poor and rich something like that the gap between rich and poor uh high society moral corruption i don't think so it was about the founding fathers and the american and, revolution yeah but it was mostly that they admired confucius analex um okay so you don't okay let me i can it's this paper here it was like eight pages Confucius influence on the founding fathers. Is that what you read? Uh, I think I read the other one that you just clicked with the founding fathers. Well, it's the same one. It's just the outline. Mm -hmm. Okay. So was there something you picked out of that reading? Uh, yeah, basically just the more corruption, really. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, and so how how were they going to deal with it? Well, one thing was Confucius Analects, right? So we talked about that in that other article also earlier about the virtue of an educated citizen. So the idea is our founders were really worried about how to preserve the republic. Does that make sense? And they really. I think, uh like you just said the virtues of an educated citizen i feel like the more that we know the more powerful we are so i feel like because like, there's a lot of stuff that i think they don't teach us in schools or the right stuff that they don't teach us in schools that they don't want us to know really so i feel like if we get a hand on that and a hold on all that kind of stuff i feel like a whole bunch of stuff is going to change in the world yeah, I do think we really need to relook at our curricula. Um, and it's going on, but it's gotten very politicized right now. But I mean, it really is important. There's so many things that I wish I had known about American history that I didn't. I do didn't. You, do you think there are like some stuff that they're trying to like hide from us? Well, it's just in general, people want to be patriotic. They want to love their country, so they're just going to sanitize the history, right? Yeah, and now it's become a political issue where there have been these two um, uh, laws introduced into a lot of legislatures in, in the U.S., a lot of states, where it's illegal to teach anything to do with race or pluralism. Did you know that? I yeah. think also like going along with that, I feel like that's why the rich people know so much, like they're more educated on stuff that's going on. Maybe I feel like that could like kind of mesh in with, with like the, the rich and the poor and what we know. Well, there's the content, but there's also process, whereas in good schools, kids get, you know, they have to write papers and the teacher corrects it really strictly and you know, they have to get good intellectually, right? There's all sorts of pressure to do that. Whereas in the other schools, the classrooms are bigger, the kids come in not as, you know, 
wealthier people, the parents are college educated, they, they travel, they read books, they do all this stuff where there's this whole culture at home, right? And then they go to, I mean, it's just, it's not a level playing field. And so it is hard to get everybody to have an opportunity. So we're back to that notion of opportunity. Um, but there are a lot of African-Americans now who have made it big and they are giving back, which is great. Um, so Kobe Bryant, is he another one of them? I mean, I get them confused. There was Kobe Bryant and LeBron James. Are they both involved in some? Uh, Kobe what? died. Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Sad uh, story. <laughs> you haven't heard about it? In the plane crash with his daughter? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I you know, it comes to mind. But, it, you know, if you've never seen him play, it's just a name, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that much. Okay, so Akaya, what about you? What did you think of that article? Well, um, in, the, in the paper, I know that it had talked about, like, rulers and how they must behave appropriately, like, in the court and at home, because, like, they can be imitated and stuff. And so it just stuck out to me because, um, like, I know I see a lot today where you have people who are exposed to all these bad things and they're, like, doing the bad things because they see, like, their family doing it or they see their friends doing it or somebody who they may look up to, they see doing it and they're like, well, okay, they keep doing this. Well, if I do it, then it must be okay. Or if my parents are doing it, then it must be okay. And it's just like, I think, it, I feel like it goes into, you don't have to do things just because somebody else is doing it. I know that uh, Titus, he had talked about like Adam and Eve, like they ate the fruit, but they didn't have to do it. They knew that it was, they knew that it was bad. They knew that they would die if they did it, but yet they still did it. And so like, that's just, that what stuck is what stuck out to me the most. That was me, not poor old Titus. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, let's see. Titus, what did you think? Yeah, I figured I might as well go next because I was basically going to say the same thing that Akaya did. I was looking at the quote where Confucius was basically asserting the rulers that they should behave appropriately in court and at home because they would certainly be imitated. And it kind of really struck my curiosity and maybe I have, I just lost a bit of memory, but did Socrates or Jesus, did they ever specify to the court or higher ups that people or more specifically in this case, kids are actually looking up to their example, I mean more specifically of showing them what will happen when people like Socrates and Jesus stand up for themselves or stand up for what's right, that they will just end up being killed off. And they're basically showing them that it's best to stay quiet on issues or kind of observe or be a bystander instead of taking action on things they believe it's right. Well, remember Meletus accused Socrates of corrupting the youth and then Socrates, well, who educates them? Right. And Meletus just said the laws, the Athenians, everybody but you, Socrates. Everybody's a good influence except you. <laughs> right. And they basically made an example out of him in front of his, well, not in front of his, but basically showed his kids who obviously looked up to their father that if you end up being like your father, if you end up doing what your father does, you're going to end up dying just like him. And that probably influenced his kids along with several others that they should not do what they believe is right. Even well, though actually, it's not the right yeah, thing. I mean, it, there, right when he was uh, in prison about to die, his wife felt bad about the fact that he wouldn't see his friends again. So it seems from that dialogue that she understood 
what he did was valuable. So, you know, it, it does matter what the legacy is. And Socrates is not quite sure what his friends or family are going to tell his kids, right? Right, and he probably knew that uh, anyone who was adults would understand what he did, but I was more thinking of the kids who don't quite know or realize his sacrifice, what they would initially think before maturing, and how would that affect them as they mature? Right. Oh, yeah, it's, it's touchy. It's iffy. Um, then Jesus, he was considered, you know, an enemy of Judaism. He was um, a, a corruption of the religious tradition when he was actually just trying to bring about a spiritual revival, right? He was criticizing the religious leaders for being corrupt, but they accused him of being not following God, right? He's the one that's not religious. So he was critical of the mega church guys, right? That were pro-establishment because they were <laughs> they were getting a lot of strokes for it. And the fundamentalists who thought in order to have a spiritual revival, we got to get back to the Bible and take it literally. And Jesus disagreed with that. And then he got in trouble for it, right? Yeah, so I guess it was as I thought. They were just trying to protect themselves, as always. Yeah, it's tough. It, you know, um, it's hard to get criticized, you know, and it's hard. The older you get, the harder it is. So I'm just telling you, you know, you got to decide because you get more invested in something. And so you don't necessarily get more mature with age. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so Caitlin, what about you? What did you think of the article about the founding fathers and Confucius? Um, so the first thing that I wrote down was how I wrote down a quote. It said, Franklin agreed with Confucius that a man should not only cultivate personal virtues, but also dissem disseminate them to others, including political leaders. And I like that one because, um, so like not only should we have our personal virtues, but like we should spread them. And like how it said political leaders, like they should have the same personal virtues that like the citizens have. So we all should have personal virtues and I feel like a lot of political leaders don't have those virtues and then another thing was how uh Thomas Paine talked about how Confucius was a moral teacher like Christ and um like how you said earlier how a lot of people get credit for what Confucius had written and that was kind of like he was saying things that even Jesus had come and said after him the example was acknowledge thy benefits by the turn of benefits, but never revenge injuries. So I thought that was interesting that even like Jesus had said, like a version of Confucius's analects. So that forgive, was forgive seven times, 70 times. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Okay. Um, all right. So I, I did want to point out that I think it was Franklin that started virtue clubs, right? Ethic. And that's what the Humanist Manifesto talked about, virtue clubs, OK? <laughs> um, so, so when people in the name of being conservative or Christian condemn the humanists, I mean, our founders were definitely sympathetic with this kind of humanism. Does everybody understand that? That that's just a misreading. Um, I don't know if they, I don't think they're deliberately completely distorting it, but does everybody understand that it is a complete distortion to condemn humanists as not patriotic and not what our founding fathers were up to? They really were up to humanism. Um, so as Titus said in his paper, these guys were wanted to put the humanist part first, which is why they, you know, emphasized Confucius. 
they really wanted to get people to focus on virtue without the word Christian because that would that kept dividing people by denomination and, and other things. So that part of it was divisive, the orthodoxy, which denomination are you? And they wanted to keep focusing on the actual way of life. So let's just take Confucius and then we don't have to argue about who's a Unitarian and who's a Trinitarian and all that stuff. Okay, so does that make sense to you, Titus, that that was, they're saying what you were saying? Yes, and I don't think they were just saying that because they didn't believe in religion, but it, because it brought more togetherness and really with the religions, it's all supposed to lead towards the same goal of virtue. So I guess taking out the religion was just the easier path to that. And I figured that's part of the reason why they decided to go to humanist route and focus on Confucius. Well, Europe was, you know, really crippled by uh, religious animosity, right? The Protestants versus the Catholics and the, uh, what, Puritans versus the Episcopalians. And they just didn't want that. There were so many religious wars in Europe that they were just really concerned about it. And Confucius analects, ah, here's one tool to use, right? To get people focused on what's important. Okay, so um, Mary Hannah, what do you think? Um, okay, I had three points um, picked out. Um, and they all, I feel like, go back to virtues. But um, the first was, um, I'll find the actual quote I wrote down the page number. And the reading it says it was talking about um, Benjamin Franklin, and it was saying, um, um, he pointed out the, necess the necessity of governing with mortality, especially for the leaders. Wait, that's not it. Hold on, I'm sorry. I'm actually going to find the quote. Here it goes. He believed that if a government rested its rule entirely on laws, its people would try to escape punishment and have no sense of shame. Therefore, he reasoned that if people were led by virtue, they would possess um, a sense of shame and follow their leaders of their own will. And this kind of brought me back to the Black Lives Matter movement and the whole police brutality. And like basically saying if we had government that still led with virtues, um, I feel like there would be a lot less police brutality. Okay. Because people break laws, discriminate and abuse power um, because I feel like they don't stick to those virtues. That was my first one. And then my second one was the, off the outline was like Dr. Travis something or another, I don't know. I never did not know who that was. And it was in control of egos, have egos, um, but admit when wrong and willing to do if someone else's way to maintain harmony. Um, and this was like the agree to disagree type situation. And I just feel like being a leader, if we go back to that, um, I feel like that's, a, that's necessary for being a good leader. Like not everyone's gonna believe the same or think the same things, but you can't let your ego get in the way of that. Thinking that you're the rule of power and no one else is wrong or I mean, no one else is right, but your way is your way or the highway basically. And I feel like we'd live in a much happier world if people weren't so prideful. But um, lastly, it was also Benjamin Franklin. When a young person proved himself worthy of high office, his parents were honored for raising him well versus those that pass on power to their children who aren't really virtuous. And this brought me up to my childhood. Um, but those like snobs, as people would say that, inherit money that don't work for it um i feel like when you're born into money and you never have to work for things and i feel like we all probably know those types of people and they first off act too big for their britches but also um you miss out on a lot whenever you're a lot of learning experiences whenever you have to 
go through the trenches, as some would say, and work for those things. And I feel like they they teach you important life lessons and virtue. And I really like that one as well. Those are my three favorite. Okay. Anybody have a comment? Uh, Aristotle thought there ought to be an enormous inheritance tax because he thought if you have a class of people that inherit money, you have a diseased society because then they lose track, right? They get out of touch with people. Um, but that's considered socialism in our country, okay? A um, couple years ago, a uh, couple decades ago, there was a inheritance tax. There was a debate about the inheritance tax. And so it was renamed the death tax, right? Get taxed on dying. And, and they had focus groups. So this is, you guys have to know this. It used to be the inheritance tax. And then instantly people would think, yeah, you know, why should some people inherit money and not work for it, right? So they do a focus group. How many of you would be in favor of an inheritance tax? Okay. Well, then they'd say, well, what about if you call it a death tax? Would you be in favor of a death tax? No. Okay. So then the politicians come out, say, we got to get rid of this death tax. And it works. You guys, you got to stop. Stop getting jerked around, okay? People spend a lot of money on focus groups. You got to find out what the heck it is and what the arguments are, pro and con, right? Um, and that is, people really disagree on that. Um, but they tend to think our founding fathers, you know, wouldn't want an inheritance tax. And I do not think that's true, <laughs> right? Because they knew greed is a terrible problem. That was standard Greek stuff. Um, I, to go ahead. Ahead. I feel like there's a fine line between, I mean, there's obviously those parents that have like that will, you know, for their kids, but I mean, there is a point of too much. I don't even right. know what I thought. So was what it. happened was the Democrats wanted, you know, it was if you got more than 2 million, right? Then you'd start, the tax would kick in, right? There was a limit. But, um, you know, that got, no, it's a death tax. I mean, there was, so one side was making a distinction right? The more you inherit, the higher your percentage of tax on it, right? And the other side was just death tax, death tax, you know, that's government, that's socialism, whatever. So you really, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. That is what it was. I remember that. Um, and well, my example, not just inheritance, but also like as a child growing up, I actually had this argument the other day because one of my friends, he would say he, his parents grew up with nothing. So they make sure he has everything. But then like versus my dad's always like, I grew up with nothing. So you, not that I grew up with nothing, obviously I have a lot more than I need, but you look like you do lose the lessons and like learning it. So I feel like all people should have to work for what they earn that makes it fair, but not every, life is not fair. I learned that out of the womb, so. Well, it could be more fair or less fair though, you know. Um, I don't like it when I hear students who, who are told that, but I know, you know, that there's more to it than that. They shouldn't blame themselves if they can't get as far as someone else, right? Right. More like life is unpredictable almost. And it's not fair. <laughs> Well, I just, it's just important that there's social mobility. And the US used to be number one in social mobility. That's our reputation. And now we're 17th, which, you know, that makes me sad. You can live in 16 other countries and be more likely to be able to pull yourself up, which, you know, that makes me sad. <laughs> Does that make sense, Mariana? Yes, ma'am. That's kind of crazy. I did not know that. Well. Oh, latest I heard, you know, and it's so hard to follow this stuff. Right. Um, anyway, Lakesney, are you there? No, he disappeared. Okay, let me go over again, once again, just 
uh, what really struck me about that article, it was just um, that the stereotype is that Confucianism is the opposite of American individualism. And yet the founding fathers, I mean, I've known this, but I didn't know the founding fathers knew this. Um, so this is, they would call it a, a benign religion, right? A religion without a, a doctrine and an orthodoxy that you have to blindly believe, right? A creed. And so that's what they liked about it, that it was really focused on behaviors. Um, so Benjamin Franklin created this United Party for Virtue. So again, it doesn't have the word Christian in it, you know, because that was such used as a tool to pit people against each other. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. All right. And then the connection between parents and kids. Um, good laws aren't good enough. Um, they have to have virtue and goodwill. So yeah, they got this from Aristotle as well as from Confucius. Um, but again, there's a reason for them not to focus on Aristotle because that was the Episcopal Church and the mainline churches. And so that would turn off the Baptists, right? And the Puritans. So let's not use that. Let's not even use Aristotle. Let's go back to Confucius. Um, let's see. Virtue is our best security. All right. Now I want you to react to this one, emotional intelligence. And what I said in the, um, the uh, video was that every few years, this virtue educator comes in and makes millions of bucks, just <laughs> redoing the old classics all over again. Um, so. Akaya, did you have a reaction to that? Did that sound like all the stuff we've already been talking about? Where was this again? I think I did the wrong one. I think I read the wrong one. Okay, so um, this is an outline, but I asked you to read, um, let's see, Confucius, Analex, Themes, Oops, Confucius, Founding Fathers. Um, there's the Founding Fathers, the influence. Let me see. News, is that it? I th yeah, I think this is the one. Yeah, there it is. So, I mean, you should check out all the, um, write all the posts, the attachments. Um, Okay, so this, the list, they're willing to delay gratification. That's temperance, right? They can tolerate conflict. Um, they don't seek conflict, but they don't run away from it, right? <laughs> okay, that sounds very Aristotelian and very Confucian, right? Uh, the courage to stand up to people or, you know, when you need to, same with Martin Luther King. They focus, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, they're judiciously courageous, how's that? They, they're willing to speak up whenever, okay. Even if it's difficult or embarrassing, they're in control of their egos. Um, they're never satisfied. They recognize when things are broken and fix them. They're accountable. They're marketable. <laughs> it means they're likable. That would be sociability. They neutralize toxic people. They know how to deal with difficult situations. Um, and then I had George Washington's rules of civility. So uh, once again, oh, okay. Now, how many of you read this? Because if you didn't, I do want you to go back and read it. It's about the current leader. Um, raise your hand, Titus, I got to see, and Trey, I have to see you. Did, raise your hand if you read it. Raise your hand if you did read it. 
Um, mine had like a box through some of it. Well, just the first page, I think. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. But yeah. But yeah, because. Okay, so Trey hasn't read it yet. Did you read it, Caitlin? Okay, let's read it for next time because I think you really, I do want you to learn how to put two and two together, right? So let me just give you one example and then I'll, I'll make you uh, do it because I, the light bulbs are gonna go off here and you're gonna, um, I, I want you to realize you can learn, you know, you can study just a few, a few books in my class or other classes and you can start to understand a whole lot of other stuff because it's connected. So he became the chairman and he vowed a great rejuvenation to restore China to its ancient. What does that remind you of? That's what Confucius did, right? The golden age of China. Does everybody understand that? He knows exactly what he's doing. And so, yeah, I mean, you can do the cheat sheet and look where I put a line, but I do want you to, to get that, to get that you're a part of this intellectual tradition at this point, and you can understand. Um, the other thing is, I hope that you can understand how easily the things that we're reading could be interpreted in a way that would lead to China being a more authoritarian society, right? And a more authoritarian culture than America. Um, does everybody understand that? It, it, the goal is more like harmony than it is like pluralism or diversity. Um, whereas, for the Greeks, especially, the Greeks, especially, people agree to disagree. And in those Greek tragedies, I mean, Aristotle doesn't have any kind of recipe, you know, too much, too little, the mean. So you spend, so he talks a lot about the art of deliberation. So everybody can argue about everything, right? <laughs> Everything is open to conversation and questioning. And ultimately, the best decision is the one that promotes human flourishing. Whereas in the Chinese, the, you know, the subtle difference, although our founders really appreciated it, the subtle difference is the goal is unity, right? Harmony. And so that can get used for authoritarianism, but um, our founders liked it because it was a way to balance out what they'd written about individuality. So they didn't think we would become too concerned about harmony. They were worried that we wouldn't be concerned enough because the documents they wrote were individual achievement, individual rights, and then people were coming, the Europeans were coming, and they were given a whole lot of independence, right? Independence from government, but, the, but they really wanted people to also be able to come together. So the article on the virtue of an educated voter said, you know, they're worried about trying to get people to come together, and that's why they needed to be educated. But also, um, there's that point that you don't, it's not just formal education. For, you could be formally educated and still not have citizen consciousness, but the Confucius piece would that you really would have citizen consciousness. You really would want, have trust and goodwill uh, with other people. Um, let's see, we have just a few minutes. Um, Oh, let me go back over this one with the quotes. Um, I don't know how I ended up with you guys on the bottom of the page, but all right. So what are the main themes is um, human being. So the definition of human being is also the number two, right? So um, you, you think of yourself in your relationships and 
Americans are kind of notorious for not being good at relationships compared to people in other developed countries. All right, so number one, you can get obviously has to do with sexual attraction, right? Temperance, the golden rule. Um, what is wisdom to devote yourself? Okay, suppose there were one, okay. So, um, but anyway, let's see the mature adult. So I had a lot of uh, analects there. Propriety is a big deal. Um, how to rule well, rule for the sake of the rules. Um, that's important. And then the issue there is when do politicians claim to be doing that, but they don't do that. This one is the about the importance of language. Um, and he says, the first thing to fix is, is words. A wise man, in regard to what he doesn't understand, maintains an attitude of reserve if the terms be incorrect. So this is really all about rhetoric and the way that words are destroying American political culture. Um, people, you know, saying all sorts of stuff and creating this whole reality based on words that you know, you don't, they don't have good definitions. Like, what are you talking about? Where's the evidence? Um, people are saying all sorts of stuff. Um, the, the next point was culture that um, Confucius loved music, he loved poetry, and that kind of refinement is important for a good leader. Well, you know, is that what we look for in a president? Do we think it matters, right? Does Mr. Biden like poetry? Does Mr. Uh, Trump like poetry? Do they seem to be cultivated, right? Poetry is about your deep instinctually related emotions and it's about sort of flushing them out, making them conscious. Um, all right, so here are paper topics that you do not have to write your paper, paper on Confucius. You can write it on, uh, I have paper topics in the previous class or the class before that. I have a series of topics related to that section on practical wisdom. You can write your next paper on that or you can write it on Confucianism, Confucia, Confucius. So the first notion is he was a social genius and he focused on deliberate tradition. So you can explore that concept of deliberate tradition. Um, I remember when my kids, you know, they would get straight A's and we would go for ice cream, right? Well, all of a sudden that's a tradition, right? Whereas if there were other things, <laughs> negative things, like they did this wrong and they got this punishment. That's not a tradition, right? That's totally forgotten. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you do it one time and it's a tradition. Uh, okay, so the virtues, if you wanna write a paper about that, you just wanna articulate some connections and then the connection to the human condition. What is it about the human condition that has caused these, these patterns to emerge and cultures on opposite side of the world actually came up with a lot of the same patterns and the same kind of moral um, uh, analects or advice, right? I think that is really important because then you learn to see yourself as just a human being, right? I'm a human being. I grew up in the same condition. I'm vulnerable to the same sorts of extremes or I'm capable of the same level of virtue. Then if you wanna tie in Confucius with the United Nations. Um, let's see, um, you can do his five 
you know, main concepts. Do you think it's a good idea to have the foundation be based on human beings are by nature good? So I've had, yeah, I told you, I had a lot of students write about that because it's so different from what they were raised with. And then they talk about, you know, if they have children, how would they raise their children? Um, let's see. Oh, I don't know how I ended up having that, but all right, let's see. We have five more minutes and I want to take time for questions or your final takeaway. So I will, I'll call on each of you and either you have some question or you have, what was your final? Like if somebody had to say, you're studying Confucius. Okay, just tell me, what did you get out of studying Confucius, right? Some friend asks you that. What would you say? Okay, Caitlin, what would you say? Um, so I guess the biggest one was how the founding fathers, how they based a lot of their ideas off of Confucianism rather than like religion. I never really like heard that before and so that's kind of new to me okay uh mary hannah go ahead what my friends asked which they probably would never but <laughs> <laughs> um i would say it's not as complicated as you think and i think one of the biggest takeaways i've gotten overall and today and throughout the readings is how everything is related I don't know if I just really liked reading Aristotle's virtues, but, or it's just engraved in my mind, but I just have a sense of connecting everything to it. But, um, and then it goes back to humanism versus Christianity. I just think about that a lot. All things are re related and it's not as complex as it seems. I think the hard part is to actually do it and you get into crisis situations and it, it's, it's so much easier said than done, but it is important to get it said. So, right? Because otherwise life just seems like a crapshoot that comes at you, right? So I do think it's important. Okay, this is an example of this. And, you know, I'm just, a, I've gotten myself into some kind of family squabble and I don't know how I got into it. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. And I don't, I don't trust myself to really do the best thing it's kind of awful it's kind of like how did i get into this like and then think about the bigger picture yeah i was going to me with problems i'm like the bigger picture is it really worth it <laughs> you can give me it. advice guys right okay dr Beck, keep your cool it's not worth getting mad <laughs> over <laughs> love your family don't love your enemies <laughs> <laughs> They're not enemies. It's just, oh, families are hard, you know? Oh, I know, I promise. Like, there's all these other big problems, like climate change. And I'm sitting here, I, I said some one or two sentences wrong in a voicemail, and I had no idea, and it got misinterpreted. Oh, my God. You don't ever have that happen, do you? Oh, never. <laughs> the time. Actually, I'm going through some of it myself. I'm like you'll overcomplicate everything. It's not even you don't have to read that much into it, okay? <laughs> Stay on the surface. Yeah, well, so in this so then to sort of make up I texted. Like I'm not getting into like tone of voice or anything. I must have been tone of voice. It couldn't have been the content. Right? Mm -hmm. Ah. <laughs> All right. The thing about text is they'll pick up how they want to pick it up. Like don't they'll, tell me that. Don't tell me that. They'll read it however they think you meant it. Not it won't be the right way. That's what's off about text. That's why I have to call, especially like my grandparents. I have to call my grandmother. If not, she'll always assume that I mean it in a different way. And I'm like, I don't. Oh know. my goodness! I've never had this happen before, and so I, now you got me really scared, Mariana. Okay, I'm sorry. I tried. Oh, to I'll read too much into it. <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, you know, like climate change. Couldn't we just stop? This is awful. Okay. Um, Akaya, what did you get out of Confucius? Well, um, 
well, this was all new to me. So like, it was interesting how he based, he was based off of like love and relationships and how within Confucianism, there's things that you can base off of your own personal experience and it's like relatable. And how Caitlin also talked about the founding fathers and how they based their uh, views and stuff off of Confucius. Okay, so Akaya, can you understand how the humanism of the founding fathers is so different than uh, designer babies? <laughs> I did a paper on designer babies in high school, so. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, it's just important to, to sort all that out, right? Because you'll throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Yeah, okay, it is really important. Um, Titus, what do you th what's your takeaway? Mm, before I get to the takeaway, I just have one quick question. So as we go on further into our lessons, how much more repetition of virtuous guy corrupts the, I mean, exposes <laughs> the corruption of the government then dies for it? I guess there are gonna be a lot more repetition of that. I'm <laughs> just curious. It'll be there. I hope it won't be the only thing there, but yeah, it'll be there. Um, okay. I kind ready. of figured that was the rest, but I don't know about it, but that's what I'm assuming. So basically my thoughts on Confucianism, or more specifically Confucius, pretty much don't just do like Socrates and Jesus did and expose the expose the government and stuff without showing some type of passion. Like Confucius focused on togetherness. He focused on love for each other. And it basically softened the blow of his criticism. I'm not saying he didn't get criticized nearly as much, but it feels like he was more loved for it. And obviously our founding fathers, probably one of the main reasons they decided to base the government off him instead of off Jesus or off Socrates. Okay, the other part of it was, is there were just these little fiefdoms and if they kicked him out of a fiefdom, he just went away, right? Whereas our founders and Socrates were actually staying there and trying to make it work. Does that make sense, Titus? Yes, man. Yeah, he would, they would, you know, they'd run away for their life. <laughs> um, Which it would have led to them getting kicked out anyway. So what? I can see that. I say it would eventually led to them getting kicked out anyway, based off history. So I don't blame them. <laughs> okay, Trey, you have something? It was, I guess, like from all we've been talking about with Confucian is, uh, I guess, really just like learning more about like yourself, pretty much. Like I could have swore I heard when it, somebody say like, uh, it's kind of like relating to us a lot. But I feel like it's like all different things we try to do to get better. But I guess we just got to apply it to ourselves. Like it, it, there's a lot. Of, I think I saw one thing. I know I saw one thing in it and I thought I was going to talk about it, but we just never like really talked about it. But it just there's a lot of like details in the in the wording and stuff like that, that we could like apply to ourselves to better ourselves. And I just see that as like this whole topic as basically like learning more and improving more pretty much. OK, so please read the newspaper article about the head of China, because there are going to be huge anti-China, you know, there's going to be a huge animosity between America and China in your lifetime. So just make sure you got some foundational stuff in your head. And then I want everyone to stand up. Okay. And you have to, you know, we're going to end our class. Confucius say, all human beings by nature are good. So everyone has to say that. You have to stand up. <laughs> Can you repeat it? All human beings. All human beings are by nature good.
All oh, human beings. Oh, that turn my mic on. Hey, bye. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine the way a class, every class starts with that? That would put you in a mood, right? Social conditioning. I don't know. I just think it's interesting to because we keep denying that we're getting conditioned, but we are getting conditioned to be selfish, <laughs> right? So yeah, okay, anyway, see you tomorrow. Did you make it to your ice cream? I was wondering. I did. Okay, that's all that matters. <laughs> but then today I decided to go earlier and it, was, it hadn't opened yet. <laughs> Look up store hours. <laughs> can't win, can't win. Okay, no. we'll see you. Bye-bye.